Welcome back to Fitness Thoughts. Hope you're all doing well. So we have got a really, really special episode today with not one, but two guests. We very much are joined by the a power couple of the UK bodybuilding scene, uh, Dr. Steph Hill and Will Dyson. So first of all, guys, thank you for giving your time and coming onto the podcast. Really, really appreciate it. Are you both doing okay? Yeah, thank you. Wow, what an introduction. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so for those who don't know you, do you just want to give a little bit of a background into yourselves? I'll let you guys decide who's going to go first, um, but just a yeah, bit of a background into yourselves and sort of what you're up to at the minute. Yeah, shall I go first? Yes, always. Always. Um, so <laughs> I'm Steph and my I, oh, I don't know where to start. So job wise, I guess um, I'm a doctor. So I've been a doctor for this my sixth year now. I now specialise in end-of-life care, um, but have done a good stint on the intensive care unit and acute medicine. I've done a bit of paediatrics, GP, a bit of everything, really. So that's my number one priority, I would say, apart from Will, obviously. <laughs> Got to put that in there. <laughs> um, and then other than that, I also bodybuild and I compete. So I now do figure. I do natural figure uh, and last year was my third year was it no second year in figure and previous to that I did bikini uh, so I guess that's a bit of a summary of me mm. um interesting I didn't know it was a priority that's great <laughs> <laughs> I didn't make it clear obviously <laughs> I can't bring it back on me now um so yeah, I'm uh, a bit of a mix of a weird combination of things that nobody ever anticipates, but uh, <coughs> excuse me again. Um, so I am, I guess, principally a scientist. Well, I, I used to call myself principally a scientist, but now it's going to be principally a coach. Um, but I've basically I've been in academia for nine years. I've started doing my foundation degree, undergrad, master's degree, and now I'm doing my PhD in my fourth and final year. Um, in molecular biology and biophysics, I focus on um, an area called structural biology, which looks at all the little molecules and how they physically look, operate and um, respond to things. So I'm looking at something that is important in the um, drug resistance mechanisms in MRSA, which is one of these superbugs. Um, and that'll be my, that's, well, that's my PhD topic. Um, but then I'm also a coach. I have an online uh, client repertoire of, I think, 25-ish. Um, and I coach a, a wide array of, array of uh, lifestyle clients to competitive clients. Um, I'm also a competitive bodybuilder myself. And have, yeah, I focus on classic physique. And I have done for about the last five years. And I am also doing a master's degree in performance nutrition um, via the uh, IOPN Um I think that's probably it the summary I guess so mm. basically we're in competition as who to get who can get the most degrees <laughs> yeah who's the busiest as well <laughs> yeah. so this is the thing I mean you got you are without doubt the busiest couple that I, I've, I've ever met the busiest people I've ever met really um but to say obviously you've got such demanding jobs and such busy careers and then also you've got the success with the bodybuilding on top of it I just wanted to sort of start with that in a sense of sort of scraping it right back to where it began for, for each of you, because obviously you're sort of in that 1% when it comes to bodybuilding of the dedication and the commitment that you've got to put into it and the sacrifice that goes into it, but that doesn't come from nowhere. So where did all that start? Like what was your introduction to, to fitness as it was? Um, so I started competitively swimming when I was really young. I could swim mm. before I could walk. <laughs> so that's my earliest memory of competitive sport. I went straight from swimming into competitive trampolining. Um, I wasn't very good at it. I ended up coaching trampolining and I coached sort of England level uh, gymnasts, but I couldn't wow. do that at all myself. I just had <laughs> block whenever it came to trying to twist a somersault, but I enjoyed that. I took that through to university as well. Mm. Um, and did a bit of competitive sport at uni for my first degree and then when I started my medical degree I joined a gym and just I originally just joined a gym to lose weight 
um, and then started doing classes. And I'm just a very competitive person. I like to make everything that I do a challenge. Um, and so it was kind of inevitable, really, that I was going to end up competing at some point. Gave it a go. I just did a local charity show to start with, which had about 30 to 50 people watching it. I mm. wore an ASOS bikini and <laughs> new look heels. Yeah. Um, <laughs> prepped myself I'm not sure you could even call it a prep I didn't eat carbs for six weeks yeah. <laughs> it's isn't it? well um, it works <laughs> yeah, might not be yeah. ideal but it works it does it does six weeks probably wasn't quite long enough but anyway mm-hmm. um so I got up on the stage and I enjoyed it and that was what I was doing it for really to see and so then the following year after that I thought well if I'm going to do this properly I'm going to get a coach so I did and that's where it, it all began so I guess just being a very competitive person right from the start um and then being in an environment where other people were competing and I saw it and thought if they can do it I can do it yeah it seems very much obviously with the background in swimming and then trampolining you've obviously got the mindset required for it just ingrained in you from a young age and it very much just sounds like as you've got into training, that mindset has just almost transitioned and been slotted quite nicely into that to then bring you on with the bodybuilding side of things, which makes makes complete sense, um, which is really, really interesting. What what about yourself, Will? Um, so mine, I guess it was a natural segue from like getting into like fitnessy stuff in general, like the fitness industry. But um when I was a kid, I, I moved around quite a lot. So I, I was like, I went pri- I was pri- I was private school for like the, the early half of my life. And then uh, parents divorced, sub story, blah, 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 blah. And then we ended up going to state school in Cape Town. And it was, when we were private school, there was like no, it wasn't very sports focused in Johannesburg. But then Cape Town was very much like Afrikaans, like sport, sport, sport. So you could you just couldn't avoid it really. And I sort of felt quite, quite like the odd one out. Um, started going to the gym and the, the gym manager, from the gym just down the road from school was like just super super helpful proper role model guy um never asked for a penny to write me any programs but he just wrote them for me and put them in a box every time i came in i pick it up he'd ask me if i wanted uh, to know how to use that stuff all for free he was just really really nice mm. but <clears throat> he was the, the guy he was the christian he was uh, he did charity work he um he had a wife and two kids um went to the same church that i ended up going to as well at some point um, just a really lovely guy and I was like right I, I really like this stuff so I had a really fortunate exposure to like fitness from an early day and that mm-hmm. was like I just wanted to be like that really I guess from a fitness perspective professional stuff and it got me into sports so I did a, a mix of like 400 meters discus uh, cricket squash and rugby when I was in Cape Town and then when I came back to the UK um all the track and field stuff didn't exist so I just sort of got focused on rugby and then as I started focusing on rugby I then came across like muscle and fitness magazines and then I'd obviously also watched Dragon Ball Z as a kid and I was like holy <laughs> shit these people exist like and they're in magazines not just as cartoons so um and then yeah I started going to a gym and there were a couple of bodybuilders at the gym and then went to another gym full of monsters and then I was like okay fine um kind of I just let I progressively led more towards the, mm. the bigger and you know thingy physiques um <clears throat> and then yeah about a few years in um the um I'll probably say like, like three or four years in I managed a business for a couple of years in between college and um college and uni and all I did was read um <laughs> read through forums read through muscular development and muscle fitness magazines whenever they were published because my job was pretty pretty easy um, a financial based job and um yeah I just got obsessed with it really and all I did was eat sleep work and train and that was my 15 hour day every single day for six days a week um <laughs> I just went from one thing to the other and eventually I, I kind of thought about competing and then just started from nothing so that that's, that's a, so a very interesting backstory, certainly obviously with the traveling and a lot of time spent in, in Cape Town. And it must have been quite a easy transition for you then in terms of you spending that much time around it, you're in, sort of engrossing yourself in all the forums and the muscle and fitness articles and stuff to then just be like one day, do you know what, I'm going to give this a go. Was it, do you remember that sort of thought process happening or was it more just the more you enjoyed it, it was a bit like, I'll try it at some point in terms of competing um, or was it a genuine, no, this is what I want to do and I'm going to go for it? 
yeah well it, it i definitely <clears throat> once i'd set once i'd set my mind on like actually looking into what a show meant it was pretty much it was just going to happen mm. i delayed it for like two or three years because i did the usual look at myself and went oh you're small you're fat you're ugly blah 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 um but yeah after that um after that period it was yeah i was pretty much going to go do it and yeah i guess reading around it beforehand and having the knowledge um before that because while i was doing well while i was um managing that business as well i decided i was i was saving up managing the business to to pay for my pt course so mm. i was already invested in the educational mechanical side of things so actually doing it for myself wasn't very wasn't very difficult and mm. mm. um, it was pretty much yeah just putting the bare bones together putting the pieces together and uh finding a structure really and then as as you know yourself as you get along further you just learn more things and yeah direct yourself better so yeah so was it similar to Steph in the sense that did you prep yourself for your first show as well um yeah oh no no actually so my first show I went I, I said if I'm going to do this I'm going to do this properly because mm. the, the two guys who I looked up to in my gym um two units of guys that are just cartoony like benching four plates aside and they just look ridiculous um that was even more of a wild fact for me because it was like dragon ball z then into muscle and fitness mags then into like these humans exist near me what <laughs> it's like yeah it was just like a it's like i could relive my childhood dream every day it was great um so but yeah anyway they were like no 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 you want to get a coach bro like you need to have a coach for your first for, for your prep don't try and do it on your own um so i was like okay i'll do it properly and then you know, when you get a coach you do everything he says you don't do you don't you don't do nothing he doesn't say every <laughs> grab counts um the usual crap what's um, that what's the actor that is the guy in ted the guy. what um mark Wahlberg. mark Wahlberg. Mark Wahlberg. <laughs> i didn't realize what was mark Wahlberg. oh i don't know i just i, I thought <laughs> weird actors um but yeah he was um uh, yeah, so I, so I had a coach. I had a coach in America. He was actually he's actually a very well known um, IFBB pro, and that has his own media channel, probably the most popular media channel um, for bodybuilding. Um, mm. I'm not going to name the name, but yeah, it was uh, <laughs> an interesting first prep. Let's put it that way. Um, then second prep, I prepped myself for the up to the qualifiers, um, and then when it came to qualifying, when I qualified, once I'd qualified for the British, I was like, shit, um, now I've got another seven weeks, and I'm shredded. What do I do? Um, and I was, I was like, I don't want to lose my shit. So, um, and then I hired a friend of mine called uh, Cornelius Parkin. Um, and he, mm. he did me for the British. Prepped myself again for the next two years. Uh, and then that was, yeah, 2018, 2019. That was when I was with Steph. And then 2019, prepped myself again. And then this last prep just gone. Um, Cornelius did the first um, portion of my prep. Well, we, we pretty much did it together. So it would... Um, I'd run things by him and then he'd make suggestions if it sounded too stupid. Mm. Um, and then the latter half of the prep, um, Tom Haynes, Evolution Coaching took over. Um, yeah. I'm going to say, I've noticed that on your socials that you'd started working with uh, with Tom. How have you, have you been finding that? He's brilliant. He's fantastic. Yeah. He's, he's so great for you. Hasn't yeah, it's good because he's just called my shit, basically. And that's the thing which I like. He's, he's blunt to the point. Um, but he will explain things like he's not, he's not, he's, he's by no means like worlds apart from being a bro coach. Like you get some coaches that are just jump how high mm. and then won't give you any explanations to what they're doing. Tom's very science and detail oriented, oriented mm. and very much very evidence-based. And that's what I like about him. Like we can level, we can talk about things. He'll give me an explanation for something. But if I'm um, like a, a good example was like after we went, we went on an all-inclusive holiday um, at the start of December and normally after like a week of like i mean we, we went dicks about it we ate very sensibly and we we're very much in control but i was like so how do you feel about me doing a little bit of a, a mini cut after the holiday and his what his one line response was do you want second call outs in 2023 and i went nope and he goes well there we go and he, he followed <laughs> it up and explained it uh, he, he reinforced it with some you know the voice note actually explaining it but mm. um the first response was don't be a dick basically mm. and but that, that's what I need. And that's what I, that, cause that's what I've communicated in the past. Every time it gets to off season, I get scared of getting chubs. Mm. Or I, get, I like, I like having abs mm. and I just like my leaner, leaner physique, but everybody knows you, you have to put in the due diligence and sort of learn to love your other self in the off season. If you're going to yeah. make serious progress and my next step is trying to get an IFBB pro card. And I really need to be pushing that weight limit for that. Mm. So mm. and that's exactly what he said. Basically. He said, once you've 
you know, once you've paid your dues and you are, and we're struggling to peel you down into that weight class, then then you can afford to sit sit lean year round. Then mm. you can afford to sort of sit eight weeks out from a show because well, then you can't you're not meant to be getting that much bigger. You're meant to be staying close to your weight category. Mm. Um, but until then, you, we march on. So, yeah. Yeah. yeah, he's been fantastic. Very, very, very good. And he's, he's a good guy, a very good guy. In fact, for Christmas, he put a Christmas deal on, paid for a buffet for like 35 people at Slug and Lettuce. Um, <laughs> and he managed to reserve a section of the bar um, in Worcester, which I think is where, where he's from. Um, Class. And yeah, we had a banger overnight. Really, really good. Yeah, but just look then. Yeah, exactly. He's a really nice guy. Yeah, that's, that's wicked. He's glad to hear it's, it's going so well. Um, just so to take it back a second, just to what you were saying, Steph, when you mentioned about that first prep you did by yourself, obviously cutting carbs out is going to make it an absolute nightmare for the prep anyway. But how would you compare the sort of process of that first prep to like subsequent preps? Certainly from like a mindset point of view, would you say that that was the hardest one that you've done or has it been harder preps since then? Um, and it never all been different. So I, I, w- I don't remember that being particularly difficult because mm. um, I, I've dieted wrong or rightly since I was about nine years old. That's just, unfortunately, that's just what I was brought up in. Mm. Um, I think a lot of people are similar in that my mum, I always remember my mum being on a diet and mm. there was always sort of that anxiety around food. And so I, I remember when I was in year six coming back from a school trip and writing myself out a meal plan and and it was like don't ever snack if you do eat fruit like I remember that so clearly so I think I've always had a certain element of control over my food and so Mm. instigating this plan for only six weeks and it being something that I wanted to do at the end of it was easy like once I just put my mind to it I can do it Mm. um so I don't think anything's that difficult for six weeks mm. but then subsequent preps after that when they were longer that's when it gets harder and my first coach that I had was a very very much a bro coach and I think there's there's a difference between what you need when you're doing your first shows uh, versus what you need when you're a bit more of a mature athlete yeah, I yeah. Say that. It sounds a bit dickish doesn't it <laughs> essentially that's what you do you mature as an athlete Mm. and I had no idea about what was necessary to get lean properly lean back then so therefore following a meal plan that I was told to do was the right thing for me and doing the amount of cardio that I needed to do was the right thing for me without asking any questions and Mm. that was fine at that point I just got my head down and I did it Mm. after that prep I then started to think, well, I've done that now, but I kind of have a few questions and I wonder if maybe we could have done things differently. Maybe I didn't need to take my food so low. Maybe I didn't need to be doing that much cardio. Maybe I could have done it a bit healthier. I started to ask questions and that's when me and that coach didn't really get along then. It didn't work Mm. because that's not how he works. He's very bro. He's very half your portion of rice and that's it for this week sort of thing which is fine it works for some people but it wasn't fine for me especially with my history with food Mm. um so that's when will took over and that was just such a huge change for me the fact i could say i don't understand why i'm doing that or i think maybe it might be better for me if i do this Mm. in simple things like i don't really want to eat salmon for every last meal of every day because I hate it now <laughs> so but take it from that to then like the intricacies of can you talk me through why we're making this change or why I need to do that and I've just learned so so much and mm. as I've learned more I've then wanted to ask more and now we work completely differently and I, and I don't think I'm alone in that I think if you ask a lot of people about their competitive uh, history it may look similar to that mm, in that yeah. you become less dependent on a coach and more of a, a more of a team. And, and that's mm. what Will's always said to me. I remember Will saying once, if he's had a client for three years and they couldn't do things by themselves, then he's not done a good job. And I think yeah. that just speaks volumes because 
it should be a learning process yeah it shouldn't yeah. just be a yes sir no sir three bags full sir 100 percent. yeah i massively agree with that and it like you said it's it's an educational process isn't it the more you do that process the more you want to learn about it the more control you're going to be able to have over it especially with the clients as well like that's one of the aspects over obviously we were talking before the recording about um when i just mentioned that i'm just doing online now i don't pt anymore and one of the things I've personally found with that is that clients are much more dependable on themselves through the online means than they are when it's a one-to-one PT because they don't physically have you there. And yeah. that's got to be the overall goal at the end of the day is to get someone to a point where they can have that control over their own routines, their own structures, and have that confidence to be like, yeah, I know what I'm doing now. Like I've got a good enough understanding to, to take the reins on this one. Um, yeah. But I wanted to ask you both about that actually, because it's really interesting that obviously you obviously both together and Will is your coach as well. So sort of how does that balance work between coach and partner? Because I imagine at times it can be quite a fine line or do you guys just, do you find it quite, quite easy? It's definitely not been easy, has it? I think it's, I mean, we've been doing, Will's been coaching me now for three years. Is it three years? Three and a half. Three and a half years. Mm. And it's sort of gone, was easy at the start then was more difficult in the middle mm. and now is is a breeze and I think it's because well it probably just comes down to me and my personality I'm a bit of a nightmare um to I don't like being told what to do full mm. stop in any area of life and Will's happy for me to ask questions but even even when he's being very sensible if I don't agree with something that's it's going to be an issue and, <laughs> it's it's taken me some I think it's been my learning process Will hasn't had to change because I don't think he was ever doing anything wrong but mm. I've had to learn uh, to set boundaries that's been the biggest thing so for example I obviously have to check in with Will mm. I, I have to do my check-in video and then have it on my phone I've been outside and done it while Will sat at the table working I have to oh, well I've had to get used to the fact that I can't just come in and say here you go look at this that's not how it that's not how it works and that's mm. we'll put up with me doing that three prep a few times but I know now that that's not acceptable that's not how we'll mm. work especially when his business has taken up so much now and he's got set days for certain clients like I need to wait for my day I need to submit yeah. my check-in the same as everybody else and the only difference is Will will sit and do voice recordings and videos for everybody else and talk through the check-ins whereas we sit and just talk through just it talk, because yeah. we're in the same house yeah and it actually saves time um but it's it's been setting that boundary that the all of the time we are a couple and mm -hmm. only in that time are we coach and client almost mm. that's with yeah clients. no that's that's really interesting because that sounds like gen like the best way that it could work um because i've had like conversations with people in the past who have tried similar and like the number one problem that always seems to have come up is that you know i can say no to it because they've been partners they can say no to each other so if one's coaching the other and been like right i want you to do x amount of cardio this week going forward they've been like no i don't want to do that and it's like you obviously you can't do that when it is an external coach and it isn't your other half but I think like you were saying, establishing those boundaries, that's really, really interesting and obviously effective because it's working really well. So yeah, really, really interesting actually how, how you're managing to sort of navigate that and make that work and sort of still be, still sort of keep it separate to just the relationship as a whole. Yeah, it's, it is kept separate, but then equally the, the one thing that makes it work and the reason why I don't think I could have any other coach is that my and I'm not the only one it makes it sound like I think my life is much busier than everyone else's but it's so erratic in terms mm. of shift patterns where I'm working um and when I can eat what I can eat that trying to bring someone else in to understand all of that I feel like that would be really really difficult but Will obviously mm. sees that he's here and he sees me go off to Scarborough twice a week he sees me when I have to do my meal prep and what meals I need to get sorted. I have to carry my meals on, on the train with me. He knows I have to train over two gyms and mm. that changes. And 
having having will know the ins and outs of that and be able to just guide me through it is is key and Mm -hmm. I just I genuinely don't think anybody else would be able to do that they just wouldn't have the time to get to know everything that I do yeah yeah how how have you side it found it on your side of things well yeah it's been pretty good I mean I think yeah right after the uh after we after sort of adjustment and experience I think um and Steph um getting into her own groove and um with her sort of mindset and also the fact like so basically when I go to sleep like she'll she'll slide punch me and pretend it's the window like so I think that that helps when she lets go of, uh, let's go some aggression um, <laughs> <coughs> but in, ser- in all seriousness um yeah I mean it's been pretty it's pretty I, I'm quite laid back as a in general with coaching mm. and in terms of that I, I never see anything that when, when I, don't, I don't I don't put up fronts when people ask questions and stuff mm. if someone the, the, there's, there's always the thing as a coach when people will ask things unnecessarily and or how do I put it um like where they've always got an issue with something being different but that's and if, if you when you have that you have to just nip that in the bud and with mm. like as, as Steph was saying if you shouldn't agree with something then that becomes an issue and but there's there's a, there's a switch for me there's a is somebody asking a question because they need to they want to know more about it they need to be educated and is it generally inquisitive totally fine because that's what I'm all about I'm all about educating and innovating if, sorry educating and uh and coaching um how have I lost the word? It wasn't coaching the word I was looking for. I said innovate, and that wasn't the word I was meaning. <laughs> I'm not innovating. I don't know what word I was looking for, but innovating came out. Um, so let's just go with educating. <laughs> Apologies for that. Um, weird. Um, <laughs> that's what a long day in a lab does to you. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so, so yeah, but then, then there are times where, for example, Steph won't agree with something, and I'll say, well, what do you, uh, I'll say, well, this, 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 is, this is what I think we need to do, and this is why I think that, or I'll ask her if she had an alternative. Mm. suggestion and then she'd say well this and i'll say well do you think this would be smart in the context of this and i'll just lay out the scenarios and say you know what do you think Mm. and do you not think that this is just going to end up going down this path which is the complete opposite of where we want to go and i'll just play out the scenarios and then people can make their own mind up open questions really yeah so that's been one thing and then yeah the whole it's very challenging trying to get her to trying to balance things with her dynamic schedules and stuff and like when 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 we were in covid for example she had three different rotors um or sorry three different shift patterns um, Mm -hmm. and those would change on rotors um week in week out because depending on if they were down on staff or up on staff they were on sometimes they were on two days and two two days on two days off and then it was two nights and all it was all over the place for covid but we just came up with a simple system of when she's on nights she has this pattern when she's on days she has this pattern when she's on long days she has this pattern and we just swap between them we prepared enough meals that she'd always have at least like five days worth of each and um, we bought a chest freezer and had a obviously some people aren't blessed enough to have that but and a, an american fridge freezer but essentially it, it was a case of logistically how can we just prepare for every scenario and just deploy when we need to and I think like Steph was saying with the bro coachy stuff, like a lot of bro coaches would just go, no, 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 you eat the same thing every day and you time this meal at this time. When in the grand scheme of things, it's if it's a matter of getting shit done and not getting shit done, like the former would not get shit done. The latter moving things around. Yeah, okay, meal timing's not gonna be quite there, but you know, you, you know full well yourself in terms of the hierarchy of things, it's last in the fucking list, so it doesn't matter. Yeah, hundred percent. So, it's just one of those recognizing the essential from the non-essential and where to rank things and where to hierarchy things. And that's where I think where it comes back to me being quite chilled out and why I work very well with busy people is it's just comes down to that. Mm. And it's incredible how many people do get stressed out about these things where they're like, Oh, but I thought you're meant to do this. Well, this can be beneficial, but wouldn't this ruin this? And that will make the whole freaking building topple. <laughs> so in that case, no, it's not essential for you. And this is fine. This gets you your 90% consistency. But if you do this hell for leather for a week and then you crumble and go back to like 20% for like the next three weeks, well, then you're just going to keep going two steps forward, one step back. And eventually you'll lose the love for it and hate it. Mm. And yeah, so, you know, a lot of what Steph was saying about her having buy-in and stuff, I, I'm pretty much pro get, giving the control, making clients and anybody who I speak to for that matter, um, feel like they're in control and in the driver's seat that's the way it should be it should be in the context of your own life we have tools and directives to help us you know 
go further along the path to whatever extent we want to take it but it's got to be an individual journey um and it's yeah just finding that balance so yeah yeah, it's the yeah autonomy, I... oh sorry what's up yeah. Steph as it is the autonomy having that autonomy and and confidence to be able to make your own decisions but knowing that you've got uh, will sort of like a safety blanket for me i could exactly i i think i'm at the point now will has gotten me to the point now where i could write my own training plan and my own nutrition plan i mm. don't think i'd go far wrong but i would still want will there to tweak it mm. and there will be times like I, I i'm no different to will probably plenty of people are the same if you've overindulged a bit then you automatically want to go on another mini diet or whatever and and sometimes if I was left to my own devices I would end up eating lettuce leaves for a week you know <laughs> not that dramatic but, I mean this morning yeah like like now after Christmas pretty much um pretty sure we just had the discussion before yeah, I left the house like 10 minutes before I got the <laughs> Fuck off, wake up. I know. Get back to your diet. <laughs> but you and and that's what you need a coach for, isn't it? To sort of keep you in check, and yeah. you can be your own worst enemy sometimes. But I think, yeah, I I think importantly as well. One of the things that I, feel, I sound like I'm just blowing Will's trumpet. But, <laughs> it's um, okay. <laughs> I don't think Will will mind. <laughs> there's a difference between. <laughs> what's put me off other coaches as well has been the fact that I feel if I went to them and said look bodybuilding isn't my first priority work is my first priority and actually although I would I really really want to do well and I always will aim for first place because that's what I would want to do Mm. but I wouldn't be broken hearted like this season when I was second or third I wasn't broken hearted I was chuffed I was so happy because I know it's not my first priority and I know it is a lot of people's first priority but going to a coach and saying that I feel like they'd be a bit like okay well do you want me to coach you as a competitive athlete or do you want me to coach you as a lifestyle client or what Mm. whereas you can be a competitive athlete and it be and be at that 90 percent that Will Mm. said it's okay it's okay to do that but I think maybe the fitness industry at the moment is is very much all or nothing isn't it over Christmas it's been an absolute nightmare I found with do not diet be kind to yourself and then it's okay to diet if you want to diet it's just like oh my god I think it's difficult isn't it because there's just so many mixed messages on there now you go on there and your brain can just feel just feel frazzled after like 10 minutes because everybody's saying different things um, yeah. I mean, I, I took the week off over Christmas, so I tried to just avoid everything as much as possible, just because, like, just for those reasons exactly, it's, it can just be draining. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I just wish people would chill the fuck out, like, and it, it, I think now we, we're in a point where people just put themselves, I, mean, I guess it's always been this way to a certain extent, but I follow this person's message and I follow that person's message, like, just have a bit of everything, fuck out. Mm-hmm. It's not like, it, yeah, it, it has been quite far too much with the christmas stuff and yeah yeah just do what you want so well, at least it's done for another year now anyway <laughs> yeah yeah I'm, but, I'm so um good. but i mean you've both touched on something there that i really wanted to talk about because which is sort of balancing your time between work and between training and meal prepping and everything like because like we said at the start you guys are pretty much two of the busiest people that certainly i know and that whenever I have clients to sort of moan to me, like, I don't know if I've got time to prep a meal or I don't know if I've got time to do the start of the other. Like, sometimes they're genuine. Yeah, you don't have time. That's fine. Well, like you've spoken about, you make it work, you fit it around, whatever you need to do. But sometimes it's like, I'm like, no, go and have a look at these guys. See how busy they are. And I know you put a lot of stuff on your stories, Will, about like, obviously just how busy you are and how much you've got going on. And it's like, how do you find that balance? Like, what are some of your tips for managing your time between the two really to make sure that you like you said you prioritize one or the other but you're still giving as much as you can to both i think we're very different aren't we in in our approaches to it so i i have a set meal plan Mm. and whereas will works more on drugs Drugs. (laughs) (laughs) we are very different food versus narcotics that's a bit by the way no but you work more to macros don't you although you do eat the same foods but so um mine mine is very much 
I will have my meals. I have five meals a day. I will have them prepped. And if I, so at the moment I go over to Scarborough to work on a Monday, stay over there, come back Mm. on a Tuesday. And then I go over there again, either on a Thursday or a Friday and stay over to the Friday or the Saturday. So I know how many days I need each Mm. time and I'll just make them in bulk. So there's some that I need to make and go in the freezer and some that I need to make fresh and just take with me. Mm. Um, And I've done that for a very, very long time. I used to just, I used to prep all my meals two weeks at a time. So just do 14 of each meal. And sometimes (laughs) I'll do that. Whereas my meals that I've got at the moment are a bit easier to prep. I don't need to do them in bulk. So I can maybe do six days at a time or whatever. Um, But you work a bit differently, don't you? Yeah, so I guess with nutrition, um, well, if I'm in prep, then my food's the same because it just becomes a nightmare if you're trying to track things and you're changing things that have mm-hmm. different food volumes and different sort of sodium content and all kind of crap. I very much keep things mechanical and whenever I make a change, I'll keep it there for a defined time period. Um, but in prep, you're going towards the show. So those things matter. Um, but when it comes to like just general like off-season stuff, I stick to whole foods predominantly. But again, when it comes to if you were to ask me at the start of coming out of post-show, well, again, like the meals I, I prepped in the freezer, they were all high volume. It was stuff like 250 grams of batter, 150 grams of rice, uh, 100 grams of spinach, and then 70 grams of some sauce. But they're like half a kilo in, in, in weight for the equivalent carbohydrates for, for a meal that now would, I'd literally shove a shake in like five squares bars. Um, <laughs> I'm like I just cut it well at the back end of a diet you come out and you you know your your body fat's lower hunger hunger signaling is really high mm. and and so on and so on your eyes just see food like a sweet shop and now seven more weeks down the line I, I I'm already pretty sick of food and I've already my carbs are at the moment on training days are like are 750 so um and they're going to be going up ridiculous so. isn't it <laughs> <laughs> I it's, think the highest I've ever pushed to was 500 or 550 obviously huge size difference between us but and even that was like a big struggle to be pushing 750 is is a good effort (laughs) I literally I don't know how he does it there was one one day where we experimented didn't we and Will said I just want you to eat as many carbs as you can today (laughs) and at the start of the day I was like excellent game on (laughs) I think I think I managed to get about was it 420? I think so. Or oh, we were aiming for 420. I got 370, somewhere around that mark. And I was like, I'm done. I'm so <laughs> done. It's horrible, so, isn't it? If it? It's just, it takes all the fun out of it. <laughs> yeah. So absolute hats off to you. Yeah. But it's, I mean, it's, I mean, like last night, last night I had, uh, I ended up um, having, what was it? Half a kilo of fruitcake, I think. Um, <laughs> Half a Christmas cake. But it's, it's it's high carbon it's, it's very minimal fat so yeah <laughs> I, don't, I don't care like I, i'm not you can't you can't entice me to eat things like potatoes and rice and stuff it's at that perfect, time of really, night. yeah so yeah. just and it's, it's no wastage so also I'm, I'm you know protecting the environment and shit so um <laughs> so worship me but um no but seriously when it comes to like prepping i, I like to do things like like i get well tips and advice i guess so i buy like um cooked sliced chicken breast from iceland or from asda absolute iceland do like multiple flavors with them so they'll, they've got like mm. tikka teriyaki they used to do a salt and chili salt chili and lime um one of them stopped doing that very sadly but then they've got like other flavors and like skewers and stuff but they're all like pretty like really cheap when you think about it they're already cooked already flavored already sliced there there's no crap in them really it's just chicken and seasoning and mm. it's already gone through dehydration so when you factor in the cost it's near and near, near enough there it would cost me like more to prep it in the, in my time yeah um than it would to have that and it's tasty enough that it's tasty when you're in prep and it doesn't taste like sawdust when you're not in prep mm. so all i have to do is take hand place it in bag place hand inside tupperware that is on scale remove hand look at number if number right put aside number high decrease number low remove and i do the same process for uh, mango chunks because mango is really easy to add moisture 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 to it um and then microwave rice and okay microwave rice isn't the most economic and i keep trying to motivate myself to cook rice mm. um but 
I, I could I just don't care. And I will cook rice in prep though, because you get more volume out of it. But for now, again, like cooked rice is just the, the microwave rice is slightly like more al dente, it absorbs less fluid, or it's absorbed less fluid. So like, and if I know I've got a few bags of those in the freezer and I've got some mango and I've got some sauces, like some barbecue sauce, some tomato sauce, whatever. And um, I think at one point I bought like 50 or 60 bags of microwave rice. They had some on offer um, in prep. And I just went, right, I'm going to buy all of these. So that they're then under, they, they, they took up one of the shelves in our shoe compartment. Uh, it was great. <laughs> But all I had to do, if I was caught up in the shit at work and I had a really busy week, I just chuck those in my bag and don't have to think about it as a microwave there. And there we go, done. Yeah. So that was like yeah. half my meals for like, like I think two or three of them. And then for, for breakfast, I'd normally have something like oats and a shake. Now I just don't really bother because I haven't got the appetite in the morning. It takes my GI mm -hmm. a bit longer to clear. So I'll just have a shake. Um, but yeah, protein and oats, easy. It takes, again, a couple of minutes. Uh, cream of rice, if you want to swap for something slightly more flavorful. And then in the evening, I'd have um, a bigger meal in prep. So like chicken potatoes, salmon potatoes. But you've got an air fryer for that. So you just wang your potatoes in the air fryer, leave it to do its thing. Um, salmon in the pan, when thingy clicks, goes ping, then generally my salmon's done. Um, and then off season, yeah, I mean, I've pretty much just been making it my macros when I get in because that's normally where I'm having most of my post-workout carbs because I'm training later on in the evening and I've got about 400 grams of my carbs post-workout. Um, and that's normally through easy sources like bread and jam and cereal and stuff like that. So, yeah. like, I guess my advice would be if, wherever possible, try and have stuff that's store cupboard or freezer friendly if you're really, really short for time because I've, I've not meal prepped for, like, I think probably five months now um, in terms of, oh, well, no, sorry, actually, yeah, no, if you factor in like the, the, the cooked chicken breast, no longer than that, like seven months now, I've been with that chicken breast for seven months, the tikka chicken breast, I've literally not eaten any of the form of chicken breast. Um, <laughs> I like that, you like the tikka one, I like the tandoori one, isn't it? No, no teriyaki, you hate teriyaki. the tandoori one. Um, but <laughs> you wish you asked me about buy the tandoori one. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so the... Um, but yeah, so if you have stuff that is like, that's, there's much stuff that's already prepped that you can deal with eating every day mm. and you can make a portable and just throw in your bag like that and then you're onto a winner. And then again, yeah, just having, if you're bulking or in off season, just have loads of carbs in your cupboard that are like high density because then that you can get it down quicker and you can just whack it in your bag, non-perishable basically. Mm. And just deal with not making things fancy. I think a lot of the things which people try where people say they don't have the time is because they try and think of making every meal a, a, a flavor sensation but yeah and i yeah, think you're works. always going to set yourself up for failure when you do that like i'm a big cook and i mean you know that um and i love cooking i love entertaining i've, I've grown up with that like i had a spoon in my hand when i was five um, oh man i still think back to the fried chicken burgers you made for us that time they still it's cross my mind good. every now and again and i'm like so burgers. There we go. <laughs> like and that was like i mean i pulled that together in like i don't know like um what was it it took me like a couple of hours to like mm. for it to pop into my head and then to go and get the ingredients and stuff but i just knew that you, that you guys would like that and i you know i really like doing stuff like that but um you've just got to have that consciousness of that food is function it's going to sound boring and broy, but it just is like yeah. find things that you like and you can pretty much routinely replicate don't think that you have to look forward to everything and then at least but then have like something once or twice a week that you can look forward to save it for your off meal once a week or you know mm -hmm. swap some of your macros in a couple of meals for one for one so that you can look forward to and you can you can you know sort of rejig your umami senses or whatever um but yeah i guess just it's just got to be a balance isn't there of being practical yeah um, definitely and accepting that yeah you can't make everything a gourmet meal but i think i think in summary either you're either going to be somebody who can meal prep ultimately it's going to take you time to make your meals you've just got to decide whether you do that in one block and it may take me two hours to do my meals but that's once in two weeks yeah or yeah. you do it on the fly with those easily accessible things it takes well 15 minutes every morning maybe not mm. even that so it probably does reduce your time to do it in bulk but then it's it's a big big chunk of time at that time isn't it and whether you can be bothered mm. to do that but I think you'll you will be one or two one of those people isn't it Definitely. and then in in terms of everything else it all just comes down to routine and 
you can say organization but if an organization comes down to routine and in order to set a routine you've just got to do it you've got to force yourself to do it until it becomes a habit until it becomes the norm for you even with us if we if we went so at the weekend for New Year's, I didn't train Saturday and then I didn't train Sunday. That's unusual for me to have two rest days in a row. Mm. And then on come, come Monday, I didn't feel like training. I didn't want to. And I know that's what happens to me if I take my foot off the gas. Mm. I then don't really want to. But I did when I did go and train on Monday because I knew that's what I needed to do because it's so easy to get into that rut. And that's even with us and when we like training is a huge part of our life and so for someone who is not you just need to be so mindful of that there are times where you can give yourself a break and say okay I plan to train today but I really don't feel like it so I'm not going to so that you don't make it a chore and then there are times where you have to kick yourself up the bum and say no come on you had two days off you will feel better Will always says the uh, 10 minute rule go train for 10 minutes if you still don't want to be there go home yeah but that yeah. never happens that never happens you never go home after 10 minutes yeah yeah I think that's a good rule actually it's, <laughs> I like that prioritization as well I think and also just like and when I mean prioritization I mean like you need to separate the things that you well one you need to separate the things that need to be done to certain standards so and we've both had a couple of touches touch bases on this this week um, from various things but um while I was weird enough painting the outhouse earlier on this week I thought I was because like, we, we converted the garage to a gym and then we bought an outhouse for the shed tools and for the garden tools and stuff <laughs> and I forgot to like to put the varnish on it or well, there wasn't I forgot we just spent like I don't know six days straight pretty much destroying an entire building and rebuilding it but <laughs> um <laughs> isn't a feat in itself but anyway so I didn't put the waterproofing on the shed and I thought I was going to get like horrendous in the next few months and I don't span, fancy spending another 400 quid on that mm-hmm. so because god and chairs are not cheap um <laughs> surprisingly but so I varnished it and like the front of the gym it's hard to describe is like shiplap so it, was, it also needed varnishing and mm-hmm. I took my time with that spread and varnish you sort of generally what you should do is spread it across um as thinly as possible to prevent street marks and stuff so it looks nice and neat and presentable and I started trying to do it with this like timber that the thing is the out of the sheds constructive and like it's like it's not as good grade it's like rough because it's just you know an, an outdoor um structure and then I was like do you know what fuck this are you painting a shed or the Mona Lisa and then I just started whacking it all over it <laughs> as long as it was covered I don't care like yeah. it's, it's keeping fucking tools inside of it excuse the Tourette's but and and then I just thought, well, actually, do you know what? How many times do you have to do that in your own life? And this could be a good teaching point for the for the team, which is like just just do that with every task. Because if you've got if you care about your work or care about anything in your life, and you have you want you're you're a perfectionist to some standard, and you want to do everything to a great standard, you don't have to stop yourself at every point and go and say, how much does this need? Like mm-hmm. I might want to do it perfectly because I'm you know I'm getting on with it and I can see the potential for this thing to be good, but. If I try and perfect this, it might take up two hours. That really needs to be spent on that on that thing that I don't want to be doing. And that's the second point, which is you need to prioritize the shit that needs to be done, regardless of whether or not you want to do it or not. Mm. Like, you know, there are times like like today, the, I, 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 I had two good days where I've, I've actually put two posts in a row. Um, it's a record break for me for the last four months on social media. Because um, I started off with all the good intentions, saying I'm going to post more and get at least four or five in a week. Um and and then today i was like yeah i'm definitely going to get this post up at some point but i just had far too much to do and Mm -hmm. like i was tempted to to go back and forth and type in between that but i just had other i just had other stuff like i I knew i could type in another couple of lines on the program um i could get a little bit more reading done on this on this check-in that i could prepare and all that sort of stuff and i didn't i wanted to do the post because i'm really excited about it but like again it's big boy pants and going it doesn't no one cares you know you went to bed at one you were up at nine you're tired and you've not had modafinil this morning so you're just running on coffee sad sad just get on with it and that's that's just the way it is you know i think in terms of prioritizing you and you need to be realistic about it as well so you know one thing which we both do with our to do this is we use big rocks medium rocks and small rocks and the big rocks being very minimal number one or two things what you today cannot end without these two things being done Mm. like these are imperative and if anything else comes before this you've got a fucking problem unless it's somebody dying um 
or near death we'll, we'll count near death or something <laughs> like that. Um, unless it's when i'm at work yeah <laughs> I, I, yeah that that um only i'm allowed to play that joke <laughs> right, that I got that. Um, and then yeah, medium rocks, slightly smaller, and then small rocks, and then you get it. You, you get it. Mm. So your smaller rocks are like your, your back burner stuff that you just pick up when you've got, you know, you've got a bit more time. So, so yeah, and I, and and that, and that's that's something which, you know, you can you can quite easily if you don't start to rank those things, and you don't do it every day, and just think, yeah, I'll be fine today. I'll just I'll just crack on. Like some days you will because you'll keep everything in your head and you'll 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 be juggling all your balls. But some days you're not going to be 90% recovered and you're not going to be switched on. And that's when it'll catch you out. And you that just happens. lose the whole day then, do you? Yeah, mm-hmm. and like Steph was saying, with habits and routine, if you're not in the routine of doing that, then you're fucked because then you won't think to do that. And then mm-hmm. you're stuck there and then you have a day where you pretty much wasted it. And then it ends up, well, not wasted it, but you do, you know, you work at 70% rather than 90%, which is what you should have done, what you needed to do. Then it gets backed onto the next day. Then that gets r- backed on all the way through to the end of the, end of the week. And there goes your day off. And then you're starting the next week, the next week without having a day off. And then you've got a whole week worth of work again. You're already tired and you're already fed up. And then you start looking at your work negatively and everything else negatively. Then training becomes a choice. It all stacks up. So having some form of consciousness of one habit and routine and two being realistic, setting your objectives. Make when you tick them, when you write them down and tick them off, you feel good about it. You feel at peace with it because no one's mm-hmm. list finishes. And if your list does finish, I mean, I mean, hats off to you. You've either got a very boring life or your parents bestowed you with a lot of money or you were tired and congratulations, more, more through to you and why you listen to this podcast. Um, Are you sure you didn't have some with that I like Jake. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> but yeah, that, that's that sort of stuff. So I think, yeah, it's, it's tough, but I think you do just need to have... Um, that sense of prioritization having habits having routines yeah 100 i have to for me i have to write it all down i've literally got like my notepad there every morning it's okay well the night before i'll write out everything for the next day because uh, mainly for the reason that you've just said just being able to tick it off because if you tick it off as you go you get a little kick out of it you're like that's another thing done and i'm on to the next and another thing done and it does make a big difference to like how productive you can be and how well you can establish that routine i think you do though yeah you do and the thing is like because like you'll you'll do one task and you'll you'll you know you get really into it and like you know if you if you've been writing a program for a client it's really interesting you've had to put a lot of thought behind it mm. and an hour and a half's gone you're like right finished and you have that kind of like, you're like Ugh, that was a bit tiring but then <laughs> you know if you go back to your list and you take it off and you're like oh shit i've got to do four things already well let's keep yeah. going otherwise you know if you're just kind of traipsing through it without any consciousness of oh, i've got all these things to, left to do mm. then you do just kind of think, oh, I'll have a coffee. I'll look at this Instagram post or some shit. And that's another thing with being productive. To leave Instagram alone. I think, <laughs> yeah. yeah. I think I honestly I could talk for about four hours on productivity hacks that I've learned along the way. Myself and Will both listen to a lot of audio books mm. and they're sort of self-development development ones, like the atomic habits, things like yeah. that, that lots of people have listened to, but I do find with every single one of those that I listen to, I take things away that are just so valuable. And I went on a productivity course recently as well that used a technique which was similar to the Pomodoro technique, which is where you set a timer for 20 minutes and work, intensely work, and then you have a five minute break and Mm. that's how you break your day up. Um, But I think the overriding thing to sort of summarize everything, I guess, is that make sure you you have a plan and your plan is realistic because if you make yourself a to-do list at the start of a day that is not doable the only thing that's going to do is make you feel like crap at the end of the day when you haven't done it Mm. what I do is make my to-do list easy so that actually I end up doing more than I planned I do my to-do list and then I've still got time to do other things because then at the end of the day, I feel like I've absolutely bossed it because I've done everything mm-hmm. I've planned plus more. And that comes from my revision days. I used to make myself a list of the topics I was going to cover. I started putting on way too much and then it would have to spill over into the next day and then the next day and I'd never feel on top of it. So mm-hmm. I thought, all right, well, if I split this list into two days, I'm inevitably going to finish what I've said for the first day and move on to day two stuff on day one that's excellent because then you end up giving yourself a day off at some point 
that you feel like you've worked hard for because you've done the mm. work that you should be doing on that day and then you can actually rest um, I like that that's a that's a good hack I've never come across yeah. that but I, I like that <laughs> yeah I sort of yeah I learned that one just myself I think I'm not sure mm. I heard that in any book the big rocks thing is I can't remember what book that's from but it is from a book and that's yeah. that's very good just in terms of setting your priorities because priority used to be the word priority stemmed from a singular and it's only the modern world now that has made it into priorities when technically you can't have priorities it should be one um so yeah and habits and Mm. habits which take time you're not going to go from being someone who isn't productive um and doesn't have that get up and go motivation to somebody who does things at a million miles an hour and gets a lot done in a day that's just not going to happen and some people you will never get to that it's just not who you are and that's okay as well sometimes you can just do your best and that's fine um but if you do want to get there if you want to be ultra ultra productive and get lots of things done it's it's a very slow process and you have to stack things on top of it to get there Mm, yeah definitely I think that's awesome I think I think you've both covered everything in uh, in, in a lot of detail there which is class uh, and a really nice point to end on I do want you to have some time this evening to to rest and relax so we will leave it there for tonight guys but just before we go firstly where can people find you if they want to get in touch um Instagram is probably best so I am Dr Steph underscore scrubs versus shreds and Will is the anabolic scientist. Amazing. I'll make sure to drop those into the episode notes as well when it when it gets put out. And the last thing to ask you, I ask everyone this just before we finish, can you leave us with something inspirational? Basically, if there is someone struggling to achieve their goal right now, what is the one thing that you would say, the one piece of advice you'd give them? Ooh. <laughs> if you don't drink coffee, you have no soul. <laughs> I agree. Oh, oh gosh, inspirational. Um, I mean, you should definitely be inspired to drink more coffee. That's always one. Um, uh, always puts people think, on the spot, this one. <laughs> I think what inspires me most is I see, so at, at work, I specialise in end-of-life care. So I have the privilege of spending time with a lot of people at the end of their lives. And I see all types of the spectrum of people who have achieved things that they want to achieve people who haven't achieved what they want to achieve people who are at peace people who are not at peace and I think that is what inspires me most just to be who I want to be and do what I want to do Mm -hmm. and work out whatever it is that I need to do to do that um and not everybody will most people will not have the privilege to be with people in those vulnerable times and see that and I wish I could give everybody that feeling, that little spurt of, do you know what? Nothing else really matters when it comes down to it. So I guess I'll just share that, that that is what I see and it ha- that's how it makes me feel. And maybe people can reflect on, on how that might make them feel. Maybe it sounds a bit morbid, but it's... it's no, um, not at all. I, I think... It like it just it gives you clarity from the sounds of yeah. it, which is amazing. Yeah, it it's it's really humbling. Humbling is the right mm. word. Completely humbling, and also just makes you think about why on earth you're worrying about certain things. Mm. Just go out and do it because life is so short. I think we've all seen that over this past couple of years, mm. and there is just no time to sit around and wait because it might never happen. Yeah, yeah, I guess mine's kind of similar. No, well, not similar, but it probably relates to it somewhere. Um, that I've just thought of. Um, try spend less time trying to be perfect with everything. If you spend a life trying to make everything perfect, you will be fucking miserable. Yeah. And yes, that is something I've learned over the last year and a bit, quite a lot. Like just, but with juggling everything. Um, trying to do science and bodybuilding and coaching and stuff I, I have decided next year just pretty much I, I, I will probably pretty much just go totally um, fitness industry um, coaching and science side in that side of the world 
but not academic medicine and science anymore mm. um because i was uh, trying to do uh, i can't i can't deal with doing things by halves and i can't deal with having one foot in one water and sorry one foot in the pond and one foot out but mm. my problem was is that i have been trying to make everything perfect when everything isn't perfect when i've spread myself doing 90 percent at everything um i beat myself up about it and where i've started to understand that or started to let myself feel good about things that aren't perfect but they are to the best of my ability and you could not do better in, in my shoes and i guess the third point to that extension is also just being honest with yourself if you know you could have done better be honest with yourself and give yourself a clip around the ear for it and say look you look dick you could have done warrior but you were lazy you know you'd spend time fucking about on boohooman.com and trying to find shorts that fit you um <laughs> and or you know in times where you've done you've done a bit too much so okay you took this a bit too far i mean you know maybe not do that much but when you've when you've done something good you know give yourself give yourself a pat on the back and write it down and think you know what this is good and don't compare yourself to somebody else who's done something and say um oh well they've done this and they've done that and just today somebody is somebody in the lab is a very well-respected researcher um lovely girl um he's been a postdoc for a, a year and a half that's a great above me I said, oh, so you're, so you're back now. And, you know, what are you, she, had, she was just asking me what I was thinking of doing. I said, oh, I don't think I'm going to post off in the end. And she was explaining to me, we got talking about the scientific world and all that sort of stuff. And because it's not catered for success. It's not, mm. it's all short-term contracts, very high pressure. You get paid at least 15, 20 grand less in this country than you do in the rest of the European countries or well, no longer Europe, but you know what I mean. Um, and incredibly competitive. It's not supported. Um for for success and long-term stuff or for family life or security and but for me all the way throughout the last three three years i've been thinking like shit am, am i am i just am i just being soft and am i because I, I, I you know it took two months off just to i, I needed space mm. it was too stressful and um, well from the wet lab anyway i was still doing work at home but you know in the lab um but yeah and and she said absolutely not it's, she said she doesn't know a single researcher that is um that hasn't come out with some form of anxiety or depression or you know being up about it and that that's my point with this is not to be morbid but um but is that when you when you when you when you're in an environment like that that constantly focuses on perfection because it's science that's what it is focused on mm-hmm. is being absolutely correct and sure that this is what it is uh, very underfunded and and underappreciated um that's that's what that's what it ends up with um and when it becomes a culture especially when you, you, know, you this is getting far too philosophical when you look into the instagram and expectations and all that sort of stuff if you and this segues back to my point if you then start comparing yourself to everybody else and this idea of being perfect and everything you will be miserable because you'll always want the grass well the grass will always be greener you'll always want to be better with this better with that but mm. you know that's the way it is you've got to be better than you were yesterday to add in all the cliches <laughs> but, but that's it isn't it figure out figure out what you want to do and then do it and you do not have to do it perfectly doing it imperfectly will always be better than not doing it because it's not perfect it's one of my love that i love it because that's something that i've always been guilty of as well as trying to perfect it and that's something that's i've struggled with and held me back a bit so 100 percent agree with what you're saying there um guys thank you so much again for your time and for coming on and sharing your wisdom with me <laughs> i do appreciate it um and yeah thank you very much Oh, thank you for having us. It's been lovely to chat to you. You too. I'll speak to you soon. Speak to you soon. Bye.